Good morning. How's everyone doing? You doing good? How many of you, I want to ask you, and I'm asking ask you to be honest. I know you guys sometimes don't like to raise your hands, but how many of you sometimes struggle with the goodness of God, that God is good? Amen. Look at that. That's at least half. I want to tell you one time, uh, you know, I, I, some of you know my story, some of you don't. Some of you don't care, but no, I'm kidding. But uh, I didn't have a mom or dad. Well, I had a mom and dad, but I just didn't know them. My mom died when I was six. I didn't know my father. He never acknowledged me until right before he died when I was about 40 almost. And uh, with that, I see a weakness of that when things come hard in my life or struggles, that sometimes I can get hurt or angry with God. And uh, the Lord spoke to me really good, and and, uh, maybe this will minister to you, but he said to me, I long for the day when Satan can't turn me into your enemy. And how many know that Satan tries to misinterpret the facts and says it's God who did it? How many know it's the enemy who did it? You know what I mean? If you were hurt, maybe you name it, there's so many hurts out there that it was from the evil one, amen? God did not do it. God is a good, good father. And we need to declare that because I'll tell you this, the person who sang that song I heard said, if we believe that and we really accept that as fact, it will change our whole outlook on life, amen? Amen? Amen. It'll make us us be able to endure hardship because we'll know who the real enemy is, and that's Satan and his demons and evil and people given to evil, but it is not God. Amen. And that's one thing. It's like it's we all want free will. We all want to be able to do what we want to do. But it's funny when 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 free will allows evil, then we get mad and want God to stop it. And how many of you can't have free will if God always stops it? And so, sometimes God does stop it, but sometimes God allows it. But how many know this? That God is good, and we're going to see that today. God. And, and the promise of Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called, or you could say given to his purposes. But hear that, there's a clause, you hear that? You have to, be, you have to love God, that's why we encourage you to worship, that's why we sing the songs over and over, some of you go, I got it! No, you need to worship the Lord, amen? Declare it. He says that, that all things work together for good to those who love him and are called or given to his purposes. That means you give your life to the call of God. How many want to do that so that all things work together? Amen. That's I want to too. Well, if you're a Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. And the title of today's message is The Four Great Beasts. And we're moving now from the first six chapters of Daniel were autobiographical history. That is, they speak of the mainly of the story of Daniel's life personally. But now the final six chapters, only 12 chapters total, but the final six chapters of Daniel are not autobiographical history, but incredible prophecy. They deal with future events. And remember, as we started this book, that the prophecy in this book is so accurate that a lot of liberal theologians, liberal meaning not hold that God, you know, kind of trying to undo God, say that it's so accurate it had to have been written later than it was. You know, they said 300 years, they said it had to be written after Christ. And so, how many know that's not true? Um, the Bible is inspired and it's true. So we're going to see that this events that are talked about today, that they were in Daniel's day, they were future events, but many for us, many of these events have already happened. They're coming to pass or have come to pass, and we're going to see that today. And I'll tell you, that is, as I'm going to say in a little while, that is what makes your Bible different than any other holy book. Because a lot of holy books say prophecy. A lot of holy books said things happen, but archaeology disproves those books. Like I told you, the Book of Mormon. They'll say there's this big war in upstate New York, and the archaeologists have done digging on this hill where this big mountain fight, and there's supposed to be all these metal uh, swords and all this, and they've found nothing. How many know archaeology constantly proves the Bible? People say, oh, that's not true. They'll say things like, there's so many, but I'll just say one. They'll say, there's no such thing as a, as a, um, as a, as a what is it, as um, Herod. Uh, I think Herod, what was it? Not Herod, uh, who was it? Who was the guy? Pontius Pilate. There's no Pilate. They said, we don't have any record of Pilate. And all of a sudden, in 19, I think, 62, they found in Caesarea a Pilate stone. And guess what? Archaeology constantly proves the Bible. I love what one man said. He said, the Bible is the, is the anvil that has worn out many a hammer. 
And then that people hammer away at the Bible, hammer away. But guess what? The Bible always stands true. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his holy word and continue to worship him as we study his scriptures. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your love. And I ask that right now, whatever distractions, whatever worries, whatever fears, whatever thing we're worrying about, maybe the pot roast in the, in the oven, if we do that anymore. But Lord, I ask that you would right now, we just focus on you for the next 45 minutes. Just focus on your word and that we would say, Father, speak to us. We would want to hear what your spirit is saying to us. We'd want your word to change us, Lord. You said heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall endure forever. So Lord, give us a love for your word. Give us a hunger. Let us not drift off and think about you know, marshmallow clouds or something weird, but Lord, let us focus on you right now. And so Father, bind every distraction. Let our minds focus on you. Let all the ADD, AD, ADHD people out there like me, be, let their minds be focused on your word. So Lord, bless us to hear what you're saying. And I ask that Father, you'd anoint me to speak your word that you anoint me to speak that rhema word, that life-giving word that speaks to a specific people at a specific time where they go, my goodness, I heard the Lord speak to me. And it'd go much farther than what I could ever do. So Lord, bless that. And I pray you'll open right now. Every heart would be tender towards you. Every heart would say, Lord, I want to hear what you're saying. I want to surrender my life to you more and more. So bless all the ears hearing this, whether it be here in the lobby or on the internet. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' most powerful name. And everyone agreed, said aloud, amen. amen. That wasn't very loud. Can we do a loud one? Amen. amen. Woo! I like that one. All right. Verse 1 of Daniel chapter 7. The first year of Belshazzar. Now hear this. We're going to explain this. Belshazzar's already died. We've already seen that. But now we're kind of going back in time. So hear this. The first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. That's rhymes. Head on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Chapter 7 and 8 here actually take place between chapters 4 and 5. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, as I like to say, King Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled for seven years before he was restored to his kingdom. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. In chapter 5, the kingdom was taken away from Nebuchadnezzar's grandson and given to Belshazzar. And here, however, Belshazzar has just come into power, because we're going back now, and it was at this time that Daniel had these visions. Verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. In Revelation 17, 15, it tells us that the great sea refers or can refer to the nations of the world. Thus, out of the nations of the world, four beasts are going to arise. Four great beasts are going to arise. And not great because they're good, but great in power. And verse 3 and the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Verse 4, first was like a lion and had, and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. The lion, and the lion, the lion with eagle's wings speaks of King Nebuchadnezzar speaks to the Babylonians. If you remember, we studied the synonymous that, remember uh, verse chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar saw the statue with all the gold, and then he said the chest and arms of silver and the belly of brass and legs of iron. Remember that? Does everyone remember that? And that's what this is. He's kind of going back now, and God's describing, let me tell you this, he, he saw it as kind of different metals. He saw it as this grand statue, but God sees these different four kingdoms, he sees them as beastly. Isn't that amazing? God sees these kind of tyrannical governments or empires as beasts. He sees them as wild animals. And here it is. This is explaining. So right now we're talking about the Babylonians, the head of gold. Archaeological discoveries verify that the national emblem of Babylon was a, lion's, a lion with wings. Jeremiah used the lion and the eagle as pictures of King Nebuchadnezzar. That's found in Jeremiah 49, verse 19 through 22. For those of you who are note-taking, just write it down. Babylon's winged lions can be seen even now in the British Museum. 
they show that he had winged lions. Have you seen that? Yeah. So they have, they have this winged lions, and that was part of, that was the emblem of Babylon. Middle of verse 4. I watched till its wings were plucked off. Ow. That would hurt, wouldn't it? Uh, wings plucked off. The wings were plucked off of the lion, and it was given a heart of a man. This speaks of what happened to King Nebi. Because of his pride, remember he says, look what I've done, look at my kingdom, look what I've done. The pride of his heart, God humbled him and he became beastly, remember that? He, he was the first beauty in the beast. Isn't it wild how our little cartoons and a lot of our stories come from Bible things? Isn't it wild to believe the most powerful king of the known world at that time actually became a beast? He became beastly, he let his hair grow out, his hair was like, like kind of ruffled feathers. He had big talons. Can you imagine? Could you imagine like seeing our president walking around like a beast just going, Rah! I mean, that would be just crazy. But that, <laughs> but that, uh, <laughs> you guys are laughing. That, um, but you know, that would be wild to see such a powerful king now being reduced to an animal or acting like an animal. But when King Nebuchadnezzar turned to the Lord, when he finally, after seven years of being like this, can you imagine doing his fingernails after that? Seven years, or cut, <laughs> trying to cut his comb his hair. Seven years of doing this, however, he was given a new heart. And he was once again restored to his throne, and he became a believer in God. How many know that's pretty neat? If you're not sure God can save someone, if you say, oh, my family member, you know, he's a beast. How many know God can save the beast and turn him into the beauty and the beast? He can change him and change her. You have to believe. Verse 5, and suddenly another beast... A second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. The bear here speaks of, as we saw in chapter 2, the Medo-Persian Empire. And that's why it's the chest of silver, the two arms of silver, because it's the Medo-Persian. It's two empires combined as one, the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. And this was synonymous with the silver chest and arms, as I said. With an army, hear this, of 2.5 million men, the Medes and the Persians, slowly growled along like a bear, just devouring and conquering people. And they finally conquered conquered Babylon, as we saw a couple weeks ago. They snuck under Babylon head, remember? 320-foot walls. I wonder if Trump's wall is going to be 320 feet. 320-foot walls, and not just 320 feet. It was 80 feet wide, and six chariots could race in the top. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, think of the manpower. And the wall, I think, went around 17 miles. Amazing. But they did this. How many know there's always a way? And they snuck under the, the uh, I think it was Euphrates, I don't know. The river came through it, and they, they dammed it up. Can you imagine damming up a huge river, and they diverted it, and then the water went down, they snuck in the, the, under the river and under the wall because it went in the gate, and they came up, and they didn't lock the gates that night because, remember, they were partying, and they came in and conquered it. They conquered Babylon. Amazing. So they're this, this bear that just crushes things. The three ribs here speaks of the three empires that were immediately devoured by the Medes and the Persians. The first one was Babylon. Second was the Egyptians. And third was the Lydians. They were instantly devoured. Can you imagine two and a half million man army just would just trample? Because it just is crazy. Just crushed everyone. Verse 6. After this I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and the dominion was given to it. The leopard here speaks of the Greeks. Remember the Greeks? That was synonymous with the belly of what? Brass, the Greeks. With only, hear this, so 2.5 million Medes and Persians. Alexander the Great had an army of 35,000 men, and he defeated 2.5 million people. Army. Isn't that amazing? You talk about why he was called Alexander the Great. That's a pretty big differenti differential, and yet he conquered them. Alexander could strike quickly. He was brilliant in military strategy. He was, he was the first stealth bomber. I mean, he'd just come in and hit you so fast and hard and so many angles you wouldn't know it hit you. The four heads here represents the, the four generals 
who took over his empire after his death. When he died, they broke up his empire into four different empires, and that's why it has four heads. Each animal that has been described here is mighty, but it dominates its prey in different ways. The lion devours, the bear crushes, the leopard springs upon its prey. The Babylonian empire dominated in Daniel's day. One might have guessed, especially in the reign of Belshazzar, that the next empire would be the Medo-Persian empire. But hear this. But how could Daniel know? Because it hadn't happened yet. He, he saw the Medo-Persian empire, as he saw, he spoke to, to Cyrus, or I mean to, to Darius. He spoke to him, and Darius exalted him. But hear this. He had not seen yet, the, he hadn't seen Alexander the Great. But now he, he, he says, he shows that, that he's, now he could explain that the next world empire would be a leopard and it would rise in power and it would pounce upon its prey. This shows an amazing principle that God knows the future and that he reveals certain details of the future through his prophets, amen? He reveals things. It shows that God lives outside our time and space continuum. He lives outside. He, he, he's here, but he also lives outside. He, how many know this? Hear this. It was uh, Einstein who said the theory of relativity. You know that, the theory of relativity? He said if you travel at the speed of light, that time is now. Now, isn't that amazing, I mean, to believe that, that there is no past, present, future, that time is now if you travel the speed of light. You've heard about when people travel the speed of light, they come back 20 years, you know, if they left 20 years, it would be like we'd been 150 years. Remember that? You know what I'm saying? You've seen that in the movies? That's what it's saying. So what it's saying is that God lives in the now. So that means this, is that when he sees the whole parade, this means this, when God looks at life, we look, we're like seeing a parade and we're on a street, we're on First Street. The parade passes and we could call each other on the cell phone and say, hey, what street are you on? I'm on, I'm on Fifth Street and we're on First Street. Have you seen the Macy's parade, the Macy's float yet? No, but it's going to pass in time by us, right? But how many know that God is like in the Goodyear blimp? He sees the beginning of the parade and the end of the parade all at once. Amen? Now hear this. That, that should encourage you because that means he's seen your life already lived out. He isn't going, what do I do with Craig Roeders? He knows, he knows what I'm going to do. That's why, you know, it's so funny, I always think of this. When he says stuff like this, he says he hated Esau before he'd ever done good, any good or evil. You hear that? And so Calvinists will say, see, he just hates people for no reason. He just decided to hate you. No. Why? Because he's already seen his life. I mean, no, if I've already seen your life lived out, I could say, yeah, I don't like the way you lived. You go, but you didn't see it. Oh, no, I have seen it. I see the beginning and the end all at once. Isn't that amazing? Can you, is, it, is it anyone, did, are you, is your brain a little simple like mine? Or that's hard to wrap around. Hear this, just to wrap around your brain. That means God, if you said, hey, remember Adam and Eve? He'd say, I'm with Adam and Eve right now. That means the beginning of the earth is happening right now and the end of the earth is happening right now. Dude. I mean, that'll trip you out. You know, whoa. You know, I mean, my goodness. Can you, can you imagine that? I mean, I, that'll mess you up. I mean, you know, that's pretty wild. Is everything is at once. So if I say, hey, God, what's going to happen tomorrow? He's already seen the end of my life. He's already seen what's going to happen here. And that should give us peace. Because that means God is not stressing like we do. He's going, I, I got a way. I got a plan to get you through. Amen? But the proof here that the prophecy fulfilled is, is an exceptionally persuasive. No wonder Peter says this. Here's what Peter says, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1.19. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. How many know people can give prophetic words? I told you about the person, right? I saw this church, we were joking about it, where this guy goes, uh... I sense someone here has depression. You have depression? You know, no, he says, someone here has depression. And he says, anyone has depression? And the person goes, oh, wait a minute. And he goes, I knew it was you. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's, anyone can do that, amen? But now if you say, hey, Nancy, I know you've struggled with, that's when you go, whoa. Because you go, how did you know that? And how did you step out and do that? And I want to tell you, God still does that stuff. He really does. I'll never forget, I'll tell you a little story. You want to hear a story? Because you guys seem a little mellow today, and I'm giving you a lot of history, so you're going, mm -hmm. okay, wake it up. I, I was at Bentley's, and uh, this is a coffee shop down on uh, University Avenue, and it's an old hippie coffee shop, and uh, has anyone been to Bentley's? 
Yeah, there goes. There's a whole hippie right there. No, I'm just kidding. Just teasing you. <laughs> but Timmy, but you know Bentleys. We're all the hippies. A lot of mellow. Hey, what's up? And so I used to go to Bentleys, and it was just it was just wild. But I'll never forget. We were praying at the, I don't know what there was like a parking lot far away, about a block and a half away, and we were praying. And I said, Lord, you know, so many people talk about prophetic words and seeing visions. I want to see a vision. Why not me? I want to see a vision. And all of a sudden, as soon as I prayed that. All of a sudden, it was like, and, and I can honestly say, you're going to say, yeah, whatever, Craig. But hey, you know, we're talking about God seeing the beginning and the end. So I just said, Lord, I want to see a vision. And all of a sudden, it was like, I just kind of all of a sudden floated. I'm, I'm praying, and I can understand when Paul says, in my body or out of my body, I do not know. Remember him saying that in, in 2 Corinthians 12? And I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of raising up. Whoop, and I like went over to Bentley's in my mind's eye. And now, I'm pretty sure I didn't leave the, my because my body, you know, I'm, a, I'm pretty heavy. It'd be hard. You know, I'm just kidding. But, you know, I, I, but I saw as if on my, I was floating my mind and I could see over Bentley's. And I saw, remember the little fountain at Bentley's? Do you remember the little fountain in the beginning in front of Bentley's? There's a little fountain, a little circular fountain. But there's this little circular fountain. Well, everyone sat on it. It was only this high, so it was easy to sit on. And it was probably about 12 feet in diameter. And everyone sit on it. Well, all of a sudden, the Lord showed me this guy with long black hair. And his back was to us. It was to me as I was kind of looking over, and he was sitting on the, uh, the, the fountain all by himself. And the Lord said, and he said, when you see him, you're going to walk and see him just, just like that. You witness to him and tell him I showed you this vision to, to witness to him. But then here's this. So I went, okay, yeah, that's cool. I'll do that. And the Lord says, now tell everyone in your group before you go over there. You know what I mean? I want to go, oh, I knew this was going to happen. You know, I was thinking that'd be cool. No, the Lord goes, you tell them now what you saw and say it specifically. Don't say, I think there's going to be someone there we've got to witness to. That would be easy. I explained everything. How many know walking around that corner? I was like, <laughs> but guess what? God is good. There was a guy all by himself, which has never happened, sitting there by himself. And guess what? I go up to him. Everyone's like, whoa, Rotors, you actually know God. We didn't think you did. No, I'm kidding. But they, it, I go over there, and I say, hey, I tapped on the shoulder. It was a guy I'd witnessed to a year before. I told him what God did, and he goes, I think uh, I'm supposed to get saved. And it was the coolest thing. God did so many miracles for that guy. It was amazing. His name was Dave. But, you know, how many of God still does that? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And Jesus says that when he comes back, will he find faith in all the earth? Guess what? We depend on natural things. We depend. Do you ever watch most kids I was watching? I don't know how to do it. But do you ever see kids nowadays? Here, here's, here's our life. <laughs> Phones. How are you doing? What's up? How are you doing? How are you doing? What's going on? Oh, how are you doing? You know, I mean, guys. We need to start looking up a little bit. Amen. I'm not saying you can't have a phone, but how many know sometimes the Lord says, put that phone down? Yeah. You know. Anyway, I hope that woke you up. Verse 7. Oh, wait, I didn't finish my verse. Second Peter. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.19 says, So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed. So the prophetic word says what? He's, the Lord's coming back soon. How many of you really believe that prophetic word? How many of you? That's prophetic because he hasn't come back yet. But how many of you believe that? The Bible says in 1 John, I believe, 3, 3, it says, if you believe that the Lord's going to come back soon, then you'll keep yourself pure just as he's pure. Because why? You don't want to get caught doing something you shouldn't be doing. Amen? But if you're like the people that says in 2 Peter 3, oh, you know, the Lord's been saying he's going to come back forever. They've been saying that since Paul's day. Ah, who cares? How many of you know? He comes like a thief in the night. I've never had a thief go, uh, I'm thinking about coming about 2.37. Is that cool for you? Are you going to be ready? You know, I've never heard that. A thief, you know, I used to be a thief before Jesus. And I'll tell you, I tried to, when people were asleep, when everyone was, you know, crashed out. That's when I would do stuff. Men love the darkness, right? So guess what? Now, not that Jesus is a thief, but he's going to come when you least expect it. And how many of some people even today in the church go, well, Jesus has been saying he's going to come forever for 2,000 years. It's when you think he's not coming that he's going to come. And guess what? A lot of people don't think he's coming. But hopefully you guys believe he's coming. Amen? Amen. And we're excited about that. But he says, you do well to heed as the light has, that shines in the dark place. Hear that right there. That word dark there means murky. How many think this life is a little bit murky? It's murky out there. You know, I used to think when I was young, I knew everything. You know what? When you're a young Christian, I know. This, I don't know why these old people think it's so hard. How many of you get older, things get a little murkier? 
And how many know in this day and age, it's getting way more good? How many know this? This is crazy. We got the Democrats going crazy on each other. And then we got the Republicans going crazy on each other. Everyone's going crazy on each other. Amen? It's nuts. It's crazy. You got, you got the Trumpites saying they won't support the Tedites, and you got the Tedites saying they won't support the Trump. How do we know? Whew. I'm saying whatever those last two ites I mentioned are better than the other ites. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I can say that. I didn't say who to vote for. I'm just saying, my goodness. If you, you know, it, it's crazy. And yet everyone's fighting, and everyone's going nuts. And it's murky out here. How many know this? It says in Isaiah 5, it says in the last days, evil will be called good. And good will be called evil. And black will be called white. And white will be called black. And sweet will be called bitter. And bitter will be called... Everything's going to be backwards. Have you noticed that? You know, have you noticed things are a little backwards? It's murky out there. But here's the answer. He says, the light shines in the dark place, that's the word of God and the prophecies of God, until the day dawns and the morning star, Jesus, rises in your hearts. How many know your encouragement in this murky, dark time is the word of God, is the prophecies of God, is the hope of Christ's return? I'll tell you this. You know, most of you know my wife was diagnosed with cancer. We believe God is healing her. But guess what? The only thing that that really does is, you know, here's what I've had to get down to, is that to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, we love this life a lot more than we're supposed to. How many know God really loves heaven? You know, I love what Pastor Chuck said. He says, we sure talk about how great heaven is, but we try so hard to stay out of it. (laughs) Isn't it weird? You know, I don't know about you, but I want to be. If I'm here, I'm living for Jesus, and if I die, awesome. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not going to walk out in traffic, but you know what I'm saying. I'm not afraid because I know where I'm going. I know who I am in Christ, and I'm going to relax. I'm going to say, hey, I can go radical for God, and, and, and if I die, I die. And how many know? We all love healing. Amen? We all love to be physically healed, but how many know sometimes dying is healing? It really is. I mean, we go, oh, no, stop. Oh, Craig, you're such a jerk. No, it is. Healing sometimes is going home with Jesus. How many know you got to die sometime? Now, I pray for all of us in this room that we'll be raptured. I pray we won't have to die. Amen? How many like to be raptured? How many like to do that? You know, I'm free. Hey, we're right with the Lord. That would be pretty cool. Has anyone seen that video where the guy's preaching all of a sudden, boom, they're gone? There's like one or two people left going, huh? You know. Anyways, verse 7 of Daniel 7. After this, I saw in the night visions. And behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The fourth beast here speaks of the Roman Empire and is synonymous with the legs of iron of chapter 2. Remember that? The legs of iron, and that's because it was two kingdoms in Rome. Believe it or not, there's a north and east, or east and west kingdom. And out of it, we see the ten horned, synonymous with also, remember the ten toes of iron, mix of iron and clay, the ten toes, which was the European Union, most people believe, or the Confederate European Union that would rise up, kind of a revived Roman Empire. And the horns and the toes speak of, as I said, that confederation, the ten nations. The European Union, it's wild. They are now 28 countries are involved. 28. It used to be 10, so it was really fit good with Scripture. I don't know if some are going to get kicked out or what, but the Bible says the main ones will be 10. And we see that, so that's what a lot of people think. We don't know exactly, but that's what people think will be the European Union. It's going to come out of Rome, and it's going to be a revived Roman Empire coming out of Rome. Verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before, the, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Ow. And there, is, uh, there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking pompous words. I mean, that's weird with a horn with little eyes looking all around. That'd be pretty weird. I'd like to be the artist and try to depict that. The little horn is synonymous here with what? The Antichrist. He's the Antichrist. And although there was some kind of power struggle, he takes control of the ten 
nation or the European Union, this, this revived Roman Empire. And how does he do it? Hear this. From a human perspective, he will be incredible. He'll have the intellectualism, one commentator said, of Thomas Jefferson, the leadership skills of Lincoln, the global strategy of a Nixon, and the oratory skills of a Churchill. He'll have the iron fist of a Joseph Stalin, the charisma of a John F. Kennedy. He will be humanly impressive. In other words, when the Antichrist shows up, hear this, he's not going to be wearing a red cape and twirling his mustache. Amen? He's not going to have a little tail that you go, oh, oh, hey, that's it, I know that. I, I, there was a book once written that was called The Beautiful Side of Evil. How many know Satan disguised himself as an angel of light? He's full of darkness, but he'll disguise. He doesn't come to you, because he knows you go, oh, Jesus, right? He comes to you, hey, buddy, what's up? Right? I'm here to help you. You know, that God, he doesn't care. I'm here. Right? He comes as an angel of light. He comes as a deceiver, and he comes to say it's all good, and that's how he's going to show up. He will draw people to himself like flies. He will be like a magnet to humanity. I don't know if you've seen the Left Behind series where, where all of a sudden the Antichrist, he shoots that guy. Remember in the, you know, I don't know if it was the United Nations, he shoots him and everyone, and what's name, is going, did you see that? And everyone's like, no, I didn't see a thing. How many know you could see that happening in our world? Could you not? I mean, I'm just like, whoa. You know, I, I could just see that. I mean, he, he, he'll just deceive the nations. Seven of the nations will immediately say, lead us, lead us, your great world leader, lead us. Three will resist initially, but they will be overcome ultimately. He will come persuasively, he'll come nice, but after a while he'll say, he'll reveal who he is halfway through the tribulation, the three and a half years, he'll show up and he'll say, hey, guess what, guys? It's over, I'll tell you who I am, and I am the Antichrist. How many did not want to be here for that? And if you are in Christ and you believe, we believe in a pre-trib rapture, that means that you'll be raptured before the tribulation. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can ask me later. But that means because that'll be, people say, well, hasn't the church of Jesus Christ suffered though? Why would we be, miss all that suffering when China's suffering and Iranian Christians? But how many know that is the wrath of Satan? But in the tribulation, as it says at the end of Revelation 6, this will be where God is pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And how many know it says, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 4, where he says, or maybe 5, 4, where he says he has not predestined us for wrath. How many know God does not beat up his bride? And this is because it's God's wrath being poured out. So that's why we're removed before the great tribulation. You know, I don't know about you. And that word rapture, people say the rapture is not in the Bible. It's the word raptus. It's where snatched away. It says you'll be caught up. And that word is raptus in the Latin. It means raptured, to be snatched away. How many want to be snatched away? You know, Calgon, take me away, right? Jesus, take me away. <laughs> Out of there. And that's so cool. I love that. Anyway, where was I? Um, but but that's, that's what God's going to do. Verse 9, and I watched till the thrones were, or I watched till thrones were put in place. And the Ancient of Days, speaking of God Almighty, was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. This is not talking about he's an old grandpa. <laughs> this is called, it's showing his majesty, his wisdom, that he is, he's, he's all-knowing and wise. That's what it's showing. It's not showing he's an old man that doesn't know what's going on like in The Princess Bride. He, he knows what is going on. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. They said back in the old days they used to have thrones because they were so laminated with gold or put gold laid that they were so uh, heavy that they'd put wheels on the, th on, the, on, the, on the thrones. Verse 10, the fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I don't know about you guys, I want to be in the book. Amen. The books were opened. And I watched then because of the sound of the pompous or boastful words which the horn was speaking, the Antichrist. I watched till the beast was slain. How many excited about that day? I can't wait till the beast is slain, or at least first he'll be bound for a thousand years. I'm excited about that. But I have something to say about that later. But the, the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. I always love what people say. You know, our God is a God of grace. 
He's merciful. He doesn't do it. He doesn't judge anybody anymore. <laughs> Burning flame, <laughs> thrown forever. He still is a God of justice. And so, no, he's a God of love to those who are in Christ. But if you're not, how many know there will be justice? And there will be, there will be punishment for those that resist him. Verse 12, as for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, Jesus, coming with the clouds. That's the, you know, coming back, the second coming of Christ. Clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Verse 14, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. How many long for that day, man? amen? Let's give a clap to the Lord on that. I want that to happen. But hear this, I want to say this real quick. He's going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. Remember, we go rapture with him. We spend seven years when the tribulation is happening. We spend seven year honeymoon with God. And then we come back on white horses. So those of you girls that love white horses, you, know, you come back on the white horses. Then we what? We help set up his kingdom here. And what's going to happen is we're going to have new heavenly bodies, right? We're going to have new heavenly bodies. We're going to be perfected, no sinful nature anymore. But guess what? Those who made it through the tribulation, those who are the tribulation saints, they're going to be here. And they're going to still have kids. And they're going to be like us. But they're, you know, they're going to be how we are now. They're going to be filled with the Spirit. But they're still going to have a sinful nature. And we're going to help Jesus govern the earth. How many excited about that? I've told you what I've got. Maui, you're all welcome. But, you know, so we're going to, we're going to manage it. And that's what we're going to do. And so, but these people are still going to be able to sin because they're going to have a, a, a flesh and the spirit. But hear this. I want to just say this. For those of you who, you know, think maybe, you know, Bernie's answer is the answer, you know, just, you know, socialism. Everyone has money and, and everyone has education and life would be all better. Isn't that what they say? Right? If everyone had equal money, if everyone had equal education, we'd all be happy ever after. Right? Do you realize this? Hear this. I just remembered this this morning that there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ. Perfection. Perfection. No weirdness with parties. Jesus ruling with an iron rod, meaning the justice will be served. How many excited about that? Don't have to vote. You know, I love when people say, how can I vote for, you know, in Romney, how can I vote for a Mormon? That's just, just wrong. It's the lesser of two evils. I love what one Christian said. As long as Jesus is not on the ballot, you're always voting for the lesser of two evils. Amen? But when Jesus is on the ballot, vote for Jesus, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. You won't have to. He's going to take over. But anyways, but so a thousand year reigns of perfection. And then guess what? Guess what? I was studying this this morning. Satan will be loosed to tempt people after a thousand years of perfection. Because guess what? These tribulational saints, everyone who's on the beginning of the, of the thousand year, I'm sorry, the thousand year reign will be saved. But guess what? They're going to have kids. And those kids will have free will. And not all of those kids will be Christians, even with perfection. Now, does anyone say that's hard to believe? How can you have Jesus ruling and reigning you and have beautiful harmony on the earth and people still say, well, let's give Satan a try. And it will. And Satan's going to be loose for a short time and people are going to follow him. Cuckoo! Now, that dispels the belief that if everyone had perfect education, perfect life, they wouldn't be evil. Bull. Lone knee. How many know there's just some people that are given to evil? Doesn't matter how they're raised. Now, I'll tell you, going, if you're raised in a ghetto, I was raised in New York in a really bad neighborhood. It doesn't give you a lot of opportunity. But how many know God still saved me? Amen. And I, I, I had someone once tell me, said, Craig, because I always say, man, why was my life so hard? Why was this? Maybe if my life was so good, maybe I wouldn't have accepted Jesus. Sometimes it's the hard things that make us realize our need for a Savior. So I sort of go, I guess it's great that I didn't have a mom and dad and things were rough. Because that made me see how life is not good without God. But I just want to say that, that was free. Just free there. Free. Totally free. But hear this, his, hear this. It would be a great comfort to the captive Jews in Babylon to know, because they've been there now 70 years, that it, the kingdom, that the Babylon, to know that a kingdom, not of men but of God, was coming and that it would never end. How many know? That was over, what, 20, 
300, 2400 years ago. How many know our kingdom is a lot closer to coming today than it was then? But it gave them hope. And some of you go, oh, but it's been so long. Remember God? A day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. It's only been two days for God, two and a, not even two and a half days. So it's been not that long. So just know that. But how many know I believe he's coming soon? You know, when you see stuff, the crazy stuff going on in the world, and you see the insanity that, you know, I mean, I, I could say so many things, but I get in trouble and somebody get mad at me, you know, because you guys are weird. But anyways, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing, just kidding. I'm weird, okay? I'll say it for that. But anyways... Verse 14 again. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. The reign of Jesus does not just last a thousand years, but it's permanent. It's permanent. Now hear this. It lasts a thousand years. This is another neat thing. And then Satan's released for a short time. And then he tempts people. Then him and everyone is thrown in the Antichrist, the false prophet. Satan himself is thrown in the bottomless pit, the abuso forever. And then guess what? New heaven. God's going to remodel heaven because Satan has come there. Remember, he goes before the throne of God. So it's like, ew, he, he messed up the carpet. You know, it's like, no. New heaven, new earth. How many look for a new earth? I would just look at, does anyone look out at our creation? This is a desert, you know, and how beautiful it is. Can you imagine the desert with absolute perfection and no sin? There will be waters coming. Did you know we used to have a stream coming down right here in Oro Valley, right off like Push Ridge? It used to be right by Steam Pump. There used to be a river. Can you imagine? Thank God there isn't much water because we'd have all the Californians coming out here. Right? But, but no, I'm just kidding. But, we, you know, I mean, we had that. We used to have the real. was it the real? What was the river we used to have that went underground? Yeah, thank you. But we used to have a river, and then about 100 years ago, an earthquake, it went under. We used to have Spaniard ships used to come up here and get the gold from the, you know, the iron door mine, supposedly. I mean, that is nuts. Could you imagine Tucson with a lot of water? Wow, perfect, right? Perfect. The only thing I miss about, I used to be from Oregon, and I love, you know, the, where they have trees, you know? We have, you know, big tree, trees, okay? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> trees, and, and, and they have water, but... How do we know I don't like what it takes to get the big trees and water? Yeah. Yeah. It means rain nine months out of the year. Yeah. Moss everywhere, even on your shower, your bed, whatever. I mean, everywhere. everywhere. But how do we know we could have desert and water? Oh, awesome. But how do we know this? Perfection. Remodeled. There will be no rattlesnakes. You'll be able to play the little rattlesnake. Oh, okay. hey, buttercup. You'll be able to love the rattlesnake. You were to play with the javelina and those I mean, the gum, yeah. I mean, it's going to be great. Can you imagine? You know? I got a story of the javelina. Cannon once was seen javelina. He was like, he was like four. Ah, he's running after the javelina. So I said, Morgan, get Cannon. He tackles him in the street. <laughs> Hurts him worse than the javelina. Ah, but hey, he protected his brother, even though he got road rash. But I mean, you know, I can't imagine what it'll be. I tell you, I want, I don't know, I'm a weirdo. I want to wrestle a grizzly bear or a polar bear. Yeah, I want it. I want it. I want. I mean, I want to just, you know, I just want to have fun with it. It'll be great, won't it? There are. Oh yeah. We'll bring them over. But anyways, uh, so, but hear this. His his reign will his reign will be forever, and it's going to be perfect. How I many? Some people think heaven's going to be boring. My goodness, we're going to have a new perfected earth. How I many? I could just spend. So if I could think if you can just go anywhere, you go Maui and be there right now. How many know that would be so cool? I believe that's going to happen. I really do. I believe it would just go, let's all go Maui and we'll be right there. <laughs> New York, right there. You know what I mean? It's just like we're going to be, think of traveling over the whole earth and it's perfect. There's no sin. There's no evil rulers. There's no scary places. There's no Al Qaeda fortresses. It's all good. Can you imagine? Amen. That could take a couple thousand years just to do that. But hear this we're going to have the new heaven too. And we're going to check out heaven. And then we're going to have this thing that's really trippy. It's called the New Jerusalem, which is a 1,400 mile by 1,400 mile square cube that's kind of, you can see through it, but yeah, you can kind of be in it. And it's going to be the New Jerusalem. Dude, I mean, it's going to be wild. I mean, it's going to be trippy. I mean, you know, we're going to have three things to check out. So guess what? Any of you think we're going to just be on clouds, little naked babies? No. You can do that if you want. I ain't doing that. But anyways, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that's weird. No. <laughs> Don, you going to do that? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Don would look cute. Anyway, 
Here's what I feel right now, is we need to learn, bring back two words from the hippie movement. You know, I've been saying dude a lot, but we need to bring back two words from the hippie movement. I was a hippie, believe it or not. We need to bring back two words, and here it is. This is the Jesus days. This is the Chuck Smith days. This is the, uh, the, the, the Jesus people days. It was this word, Maranatha. Does anyone remember Maranatha? It, just like the Jews would greet one another with shalom, the early Christians used to say Maranatha. Does anyone know what Maranatha means? What does it mean? The Lord is coming. It means the Lord is coming or come, O Lord. I like that. Come, O Lord. Maranatha. Because guess what? Are things getting murky out there? So what do you need to say to each other? Hey, chill out. Maranatha, the Lord's coming. Amen? You wait? Hello? The Lord is coming. Rest. The Lord is coming. Then you go, oh, but that's escapism. Well, then stress out and get an ulcer for Jesus. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. And we're going to either meet him here, there, or in the air. We're going to meet him, and we need to rest in it. Another word we need to learn again is Hosanna, which also means what? Save now. They said that when they saw Jesus. Remember that? When they said we want to make him king, and he's coming in on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna. Remember what Jesus said? He will not come back till the people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. We should be crying out, save now. And I want to end this with this. There's a scripture for it that says Hosanna and kind of says Maranatha. It's this, Psalms 118, verse 25. It's a good one to memorize. It says, save now, I pray, O Lord. There it is, Hosanna. Save now, I pray, O Lord. That's the root where we get it. Hosanna is a Greek word, but this is the root of it in the Hebrew. Save now, I pray, O Lord. And here it is. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity or success. How many know we need to pray that for our country? And not just success monetarily, but success with government. That we turn back to our biblical principles. Did you hear this this week? Can I make you want to say Hosanna and Maranatha? Did you know that the Bible is now in the top ten list of most discouraged books in public libraries, libraries and uh, schools? The Bible. Do you know the Koran is way down on the list? The Koran is more favored in our country than the Bible. Can anyone say, save now? Maranatha. Amen. Maranatha. You know, I mean, it's crazy. Crazy. But how do we know God is bigger than all this? He is. And you have to believe that. Because if you don't, you're not you're going to be one of those Christians. Praise the Lord. God's good. He's good. <laughs> no. God is good. He is good. Good. We're going to sing that again. Can we sing that again? He is good. But hear this. Here's what I believe God showed me. Here's what I want to end with today. There are two things we should be praying every day. Besides saying Hosanna and Maranatha, we should be doing this. We should pray either for revival or for his return. Amen? Because it's getting nuts out there. It's getting crazy out there. We need to pray for revival. What I don't mean, and I don't mean an ooh, ooh, exciting meeting, right, at a Pentecostal meeting. I'm saying a change, an awakening back to God. Amen? Amen. An awakening back to God. And we need to pray that. We need to pray for an awakening back to God, and, or we need to pray, Lord, come back. How many know there will be a time when this world gets so crazy that the Lord will just have to say, i got to take them out. But I want to tell you this, hear this church, let's not go, Jesus take the wheel and just let go, <laughs> crash it into the rocks. No, we need to go out swinging for God. Amen. Amen? We need to do our best to say on my watch, I'm not going to be a wicked, lazy servant and bury my talents, but I'm going to go for it as long as I'm here on this earth. Amen. Until they jail me or kill me, I'm going to go for it. Amen? Amen? And I want to encourage you guys, because guess what? The Church of Jesus Christ is still supposed to be 80 million people. That's almost one-third of our country. But guess what? We are, we've been duped. We've been told we're nothing. We've been told we're powerless. We've been told no one loves Jesus. How many know some people have told me they're afraid of, of, of Ted Cruz being present? Because why? People might hate Christianity. Let me get a little word out to you guys. People already hate Christianity! But guess what? If we'll be true Christians, maybe people will say, my goodness, Jesus might actually turn this world around. I mean, didn't he do that before? Didn't, didn't, didn't the, the Jesus movement save a generation of hippies? 
Any old people remember that? that? I remember when John Corson said, he goes, when all the hippies were getting saved with Chuck Smith, we were going, it's the end times, the Antichrist. Chuck Smith is the Antichrist. Oh my goodness. But how many know when people saw those hippies really change, they went, my goodness. Here's, here's John Corson, who was a good old Baptist boy, was thinking, the world's coming to the end, hippies are getting saved. But he went, my goodness, it's real. How many know God can do that again? And I say, Lord, either do it again or get us out of here. Because I'm kind of tired of this. Bleh. Right? Bleh. I want revival. Give me, what is it? Give me liberty or give me death. Give me revival or give me death. <laughs> Everyone's like, good for you, Craig. I don't want that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I better shut up and pray. But, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. and Lord, I just pray right now that, Father God, I ask that if there's anyone here today who is going, what are you talking about, tribulation? What are you talking about, rapture? And What are you talking about, the Lord coming back? I pray, Father, you said, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. I pray, Father, there's anyone here that is afraid of, I don't know where I'm going, and I've done so many things, and I just, I don't know if I know God. I ask that right now, Lord, you would reveal yourself to them, and that, Father, they could be secure, that even in these tumultuous, crazy times, that they could know you, that all they have to do, your word says that, that, if, that you would, that to all who receive him, you, Jesus, you give them the right become children of God. May everyone here today who's not sure they're saved, who's not sure they're going to miss out on the outpouring of God's wrath on this world, and they say, I want to know that. I want to know that I'm secure in Christ. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know God personally. I ask that your Holy Spirit would draw them right now. And I pray, Father, that they would receive you. They would just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live for you. Thank you for saving me, for it's in Jesus' name I ask. It's that simple. And I pray that everyone here would leave, not afraid, but leave joyful, saying, God is good. God has rescued me from the craziness of this world. So Lord, bless your people. Help them. Help us to bring back Maranatha. Save now. Come, Lord Jesus, and Hosanna. Help us to bring back those words, Lord, just to say that, Lord. To say, come, O Lord. Maranatha, come, O Lord. We love you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.